And then you'll present the report, and I said the purposes of the presentation is oh, no, it's not with the But I did say, as opposed to wordsmithing, but I did say not that they're not that the details are important. <laughs> Please see me after the meeting. Take me one for a second. You can go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you stop by and drink? Well, sure. I did that a few times. So, this is the one. Just takes it if it's sometimes if it fits within. We want to check out the nursing station. I wasn't planning on doing something. They're going to make it. Say, give or take two minutes. Finally, mm -hmm. a sudden door. Yep. So you got to start working. Well, I know. Sarah, Sarah, you, this is ridiculous. Because I said they got the McGovern Day dinner right here. Okay. That'd be perfect. Good. Yeah. Oh, good. 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 Yeah, well, I got a few prize for this. Well, let's him. see, Brian. Um, yeah. Missing a couple. Um, yeah. Sorry, you should along with it. Brian Grady, and then. Uh, it's time for her. I want to get a little bit of a heads up here. I'm not sure when she'll go. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Oh, he and. Well, and she has. She has. Yeah, but of course, she never had any relationship. Right. That's, that's probably not, she's not, not feeling make well. You feel well. Feel well. Uh -huh. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, I bring it. Good evening. Thank you, Deanne, for providing another wonderful meeting or another wonderful dinner. Kathy's coming into the meeting. We are going to just quickly go over what our agenda looks like for this evening. Um, item three, you'll see that after the last meeting, based upon your feedback and questions, um, Todd Veek and Doug Morrison took time to further analyze the scope of the facility um, projects uh, related to the financing. And so tonight they will review a scenario um, for the purposes of our discussion. Item four, Joe Donovan is with us again this evening. He will present the draft report. Um, the purposes of that presentation is to voice our, if there's any big concerns, um, as opposed to wordsmithing or any details, um, small uh, details. Um, if there are some minor changes um, that you'd like to have made, please visit with me or Vernon or Joe um, after the meeting. The fifth item is the timeline uh, going forward. And then sixth, we have um, kind of our uh, wrap up and final thoughts. And then we have Kate Parker with us this evening to share a few um, thoughts. And then last, we will open up time for any uh, public uh, questions or input. Kate. 
So last time we left off, we were struggling with where we were going to be in the bonding number. And uh, we're gonna jump right ahead uh, to what Doug and Todd have worked on to present to the board. Um, hopefully you have lots of questions and input here. Um, so you have an understanding of, of where they came up with these numbers because as I indicated in the message to you, I think it's pretty exciting. So Doug. Okay, there we go. All right, um, good evening everybody. Um, this, uh, what I'm gonna show you first here, you don't, you've had in your materials before, so we didn't pass it out again, but we're just gonna go back to, if you remember the concept of the capital outlay fund and how we do an assessment um, and we collect money specifically tell, towards capital outlay, and so you can see that top line, the revenue number is really um, our levy um, that goes uh, out against the assessed valuation. Uh, and this, so you can see $2.86. And we're limited by statute to what that can be charged. In the old days, we could go up to $3 for that. We can't anymore. And I think we talked a little bit about that. Um, and then we have the uses of that. And then what you'll see there is a line called undesignated. And simply that would be the line that we used to fund the projects that we're talking about here tonight or through this task force process. So we would build elementary schools, do improvement to schools, uh, whatever else needed to be built in the district. And if we needed to, we would uh, issue capital outlay certificates and that would go towards debt financing. So. What you can see there is starting in FY20, you can see that number gets up to be up in the $6 million range. And I think if you were going out farther, it would be 9 million and it would keep growing as the assessed valuation going. So when we look at it as a district, to be honest, uh, we would have to say that uh, if we're going to fund these projects out of the uh, uh, bonds, issuing bonds and that debt service and, and doing a levy on that, that really we should be offsetting some of that impact with the funds out of the capital outlay um, fund. And so what, we've, what we're going to talk about here in a minute is essentially that concept, is that we would issue bonds for some number, between 150 and $200 million maybe, and then we would lower the levy on the existing capital outlay fund to partially offset that. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide here, which you all have in front of you, um, and I think was sent out to you in advance, but I made a copy again uh, for you. And uh, we'll kind of walk through that. Uh, it's a little busy, but uh, try to get everything on one page um, so we can keep point of reference. So. Down the left-hand side there in the uh, upper left-hand corner, you can see uh, the various projects that we've been talking about. And the only difference between that and what we were talking about before is you'll see an inflation factor of $14 million at the bottom there. So in, the, in previous meetings, we've been talking about present day uh, dollars of what it would cost to do one of these projects if we built it today. Uh, we know that that's, those projects will be phased and built in over time. Material will increase, labor will increase, and so uh, we had Jeff Kreider put his best estimate together of what inflation would cost on those projects, and so uh, we added that into it, and, and so we're talking about a, a menu essentially of $229 million worth of, of projects out there. Um, so if we look at the next columns over, you'll see current bond referendum and future bond referendum. So uh, essentially uh, trying to decide what to do with that $229 million. In this scenario, we put everything uh, in the current bond referendum, um, which would be the one that we would go to vote in September, uh, except for the 
construction piece of Whittier, we still have 4.7 million in there for uh, land acquisition and, and whatever we need to do to prepare that site for eventual replacement. And then we took out uh, or said that we would probably delay or find other ways to pay for about $3 million uh, in projects. And so what we, in this scenario, were proposing was about $190 million in, in uh, bond issuance. And so, um, that I'll come back to that number in a minute. And then we would issue those, that $190 million worth of bonds over uh, probably two tranches because we wouldn't need the elementary school for so many years, so we would probably delay that and issue debt w out uh, when we had to. Um, and so in this, in this scenario, it was $164 million in year one and, an, and another $26 million in year two. So now we'll go to the middle section uh, where you start to see a lot of numbers. And so what you have here is you'll see on the left-hand column, you'll see an 88 cents number up there. 88 cents is the amount that it would cost uh, on the bond levy to do the $190 million in uh, projects. And so uh, if you follow that over, you can see a home value. Uh, we have various scenarios there. You'll see the $185 million one is the approximate average price of a, a property in Sioux Falls. And then you'll see the impact of the bond, which is the impact of the 88 cents, and the annual impact of the home at the various levels. And I think that's what you were seeing before when we uh, did some various scenarios of this. What's new is that um, what we have is a offset of 75 cents there. And uh, what that offset is, is to bring the total between the uh, capital outlay levy and the bond levy to $3. It was the old amount that we were allowed to go to in the old capital outlay fund. Um, and I'm just gonna have Todd say a few words about um, what the last time we issued bonds in 1997, we had a uh, essentially, uh, sitting, sitting here at this time, there was sort of a similar promise or scenario made at the time. And so, let's have Todd maybe comment on that. He has the most history of that. Yeah, I wasn't here in 97, but uh, I came in 2001, and we were living under a promise that was made in 97, which is between the bond, the cost of the bond, the debt service on the bond, which was passed, and the capital outlay levy, th they would not the total new levy would equal what the old capital outlay levy was. And that was a five-year promise. So I was kind of got here right at the end of that promise and we kept it going till that, till that bond was retired, which was about three years ago. So not only did the current board at the time keep that promise, um, we just kept extending it and extending it until like 2013 or 2014 when that bond was finally retired. Maybe it was 2015. But uh, so this is a similar, similar concept we've talked about the three dollar mark was kind of what we had planned for got changed in the 2016 legislature so our idea was we'll make of the promise for take it to the board to make up the promise of a three dollar levy between the two and uh, make a 10-year promise because this is a 10-year plan so what you'll see there then is the 75 cents, which is the offset, getting to a net 13 cents. So where the 13 cents is, it's the $2.87 current, uh, cent current levy plus the 13 gets us to $3. And our commitment for the next 10 years um, would be that uh, that wouldn't go above $3. So then what you see uh, about in the middle there is a capital outlay offset. Uh, numbers, so you'll see like the $6.25, 75 cents on $100,000 home. That's really the offset to the bond levy. So the net at the end of the day is kind of the shaded area there. That would be the monthly impact to the homeowner. So to do $190 million um, in projects, it would cost the average home payer at $185,000, $2 a month or $24 per year. Uh, and then you can see it's a little, about one and a half percent roughly of what somebody would currently pay, be paying today. So Deanne, if you go up to the right hand side, you'll see in that box, you'll see the, the current uh, 
levies at the district, $8.27, and then you would see the proposed $8.40 or the net increase of 13 cents. Uh, and then if you go down to the bottom, you'll see our neighboring school districts um, coming in at $8.40. Uh, we would be um, right close to the bottom or next to the bottom as far as our total levy would go. Um, going back up to that $190 million number and why that number is important. The $190 million number um, when Todd, when we run the projections out, um, that's essentially the amount that we can afford to do based on the $3 promise. So any, any projects essentially over that $190 million mark uh, would mean we would go over the $3 mark um, and because we would have to somehow come up with more debt service and everything. So we feel good in that range um, because we can, uh, you know, utilize the $3 concept and also keep enough money in the uh, capital outlay fund to do some miscellaneous projects that we know we'll probably have to do along the way as well. So that's, um, that's the concept. Any questions? Doug, could you just go back? If you, we, if we divide the bond issuance up into, I'll call it phases, when do you think that second phase would start in terms of the, the tax impact to the property owners? Well, it, the, so the how impact. So how much would it start out, and then how much would it, how long would it take to get to the full amount? You understand what I'm asking? I understand, okay. but and I and I. Thought that too originally, but I had to. I have to kind of backpedal and say it's three dollars to the taxpayer. It's always three dollars. So, um, if I phase, if I do more projects on the on the back end, uh, it may be that I can. You know, we're running pretty lean on three dollars for the first couple of years. To be honest, we've got a little bit in reserve, uh, eight or nine million dollars in reserve, but it gets pretty lean in those first years, uh, running on the the three dollar mark. So. Um, but I think for the taxpayer to conceptualize, it's always $3 for the next 10 years. So, um, and then we would, to try to save anything we could, we would, we would try to do multiple issuances, um, depending on the, you know, the, the cost and feasibility and all that of doing that. We just have two tranches in there right now, knowing that at least probably the elementary school, we don't have to do right away um, under that scenario, so. In the 190, uh, of course, the only thing that's excluded significantly is the Whittier construction. So that would occur, I assume, after the 10-year mark. But can you just, if you had a discussion about how we would how we would pay for that project, whether it's 10 years from now or 12 or 15 years from now? For for well, I for think the, when I think, when, yeah. when time comes to replace Whittier. Yeah, I think, I don't know, Todd, you wanna? I think after the 10 year mark, what, uh, you know, what will, uh, what will happen essentially is we'll be down in the, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but we'll be in the, probably the low um, twos by then, right? But we'll still have the capacity to go up to, um, Three dollars, or less, a little bit less than three dollars, whatever we're allowed to statute, you know, to do by statute. So at that point, the next task force could decide to do another incremental bond issue or do capital outlay certificates, if if that was their choice. I don't know, Todd, if you have anything to. No, that's about what I was going to say. That, presumably, they're going to have to come up with a new plan, and it might involve more than just Whittier. We've talked about Lowell, possibly. And some other, we know there's going to be needs. We don't, maybe it's more uh, bringing kind of the more the 97 deal where they're bringing up current facilities to standard or whatnot. So they'll, they'll have to make a decision then. But you will have, we, we did do a lot of this under capital outlay certificates in the past. We still have some debt. That's going to be being retired over the next 10 years. So there will, there will be that option. You may not have to go to a bond. You might, but that'll be for that task force that'll meet eight or nine or 10 years from now to make a recommendation. 
as like you said, I suspect there'll be other needs, maybe not solving for enrollment, but you know, other aging facilities and stuff like that for the next uh, um, task force, Whittier being one of them. But uh, I think, I think including the uh, acquisition piece of it and whatever we need to do to start to prepare for that replacement at that site is probably a good message to keep that part in there. Todd, as I remember in the first meeting you talked about, the only debt the school district had is, is about 123 million in the capital outlay bonds, correct? Right now, yes. And we're paying off how much every year? Um, yeah, I can't Sorry. cut it off the top of my head. I, uh, it, you know, I, I can tell you what it'll be if you give me two minutes. <laughs> I can tell you what it'll be in 10 years from now. How that'd much be great, be that might be helpful. Go back to that other, the slide before that. I think we have the debt service on there. It's not all principal, but. Um, previous slide, you previous slide. The slide before that. Uh, this is the capital outlay slide. Oh. Yeah, that one. You can see the debt service payments at the top there running probably 12, $13 million. Some of that will start to fall off. Um, I always like to say our, our hundred and, 30-ish million dollars in debt um, is the same amount that Harrisburg has, and they have a 20% of the valuation that we do. So I think we've been pretty good stewards with our uh, our debt load that the district is having or has. And this bond would be, uh, how far out would it go? We're talking 20, 25 years? Or? 25 is 25 we, years. The scenario we and the 97 in. bond was retired early. Is that correct? That correct. was a 24 year debt service, and we retired it like three years early. <clears throat> so, what I'm hearing is that 10 years hence, or 12, or whenever we replace Whittier, we think we will have some additional flexibility because we'll be well under that $3. Correct. Our debt service payments next year are 14 million. Debt service payments next year, $14 million. In 2028, they'll be 8.8 .8 million. And that's capital LA debt service. <clears throat> uh, question. Um, you know, a number of these projects don't have to be done tomorrow, and so would you ever consider a strategy that says the five to six million dollars that you have in essentially cash each year from capital outlay that you continue to basically take down these projects with the exception of the new high school and middle school. So if you could accomplish that, then would you have essentially the same levy uh, result for the property owner, and then you'd only have to go to the market for like $126 million. And then each year, for example, you'd, you know, you can, like the Cleveland gym, that's one year's worth of capital outlay. So you're doing that with cash. Um, you know, you can group some of these other projects as that capital outlay goes up, and ultimately you're still leveraging those dollars. You're just doing a, a portion of this priority list with cash, and then you're ultimately only going to the bond market for 126 million. The only, the only downside of that is there's no hedge in case there's another law change that comes out of here or something. So we could load up on a capital outlay side, um, and all of a sudden, so, you know, we, we never dreamed we would be below $3, but now we're, you know, we can't get back to $3. And so if there was something else to come out of here that would further limit us, um, that would that would significantly hurt us uh, in that sense from just from a contingency standpoint. Wait, why aren't we quite there? Because we're not why are we building a new middle school before we replace, replace the one that's 100 years old? Why aren't we? Why it's this new middle school? Mm -hmm. when, why aren't Whittier being replaced first? Because that wouldn't address doesn't, our growing enrollment. Doesn't solve for enrollment. 
And I guess that's the board's ultimate decision, but that's probably the current thinking is in a priority list is we have to solve for enrollment. Replacing Whittier doesn't solve for enrollment. So from a priority standpoint, I think we, we know those kids are in our district and, and coming our way, so. I see the shiny new middle school drawing lots of people. It was also my understanding Whittier is still like a four or five years out because they still have all that land to get before they could actually start a construction anyway. So I think either way, the new one would have to come first just because the land acquisition hasn't even happened. Yeah. <clears throat> Doug, can you just maybe clarify for me, what is the risk with state legislature? I'm not following you on that. Piece. What's the, the risk? Mm -hmm. That somehow that we're limited on our capital outlay ability to levy on the capital outlay side. So we can't levy on that part, part anymore. So we've, we've taken more of those projects and put it into the capital outlay fund, uh, assuming that uh, part of our assumption is that we will get growth um, off the assessed value out in time, and that's part of how, how we're able to do the, the combined $3 scenario. It'd be like the state, which is entirely possible, like the legislature saying, we're gonna limit the city's second penny sales tax and not allow you to take that full extra penny. I think that's probably the parallel discussion, except in the school district, it'd be the capital outlay levy. Okay. I think the results are great. I was just just trying to see if you can still accomplish the list and only go to the market for 126 million and then do the balance of the project with cash. Yeah, I think we I think we we'd be in a scenario probably doing some sort of capital outlay certificates again which would probably come back to you know um, issuing more debt. It's just, you know, what form it was in. Um, but not having any any sort of contingency or ability to uh, ri raise above that if we needed to. Aaron, did you have a question? Well, just just a comment. I'm, I'm I'm hearing discussion that's talking about more or less the prioritization, the order of the dollars rather than the, just the total dollar amount. And I didn't know if it maybe belonged um, after a part of the discussion of the presentation of the task force report and how that's kind of organized and. Maybe, maybe those pieces of feedback could fit into there. Kathy. I think the hammer here is the, the $3. And that's, that's really what is the lever that, that keeps everything in line, um, not only across the state, but with us. And when you're looking at 4% interest, we're not gonna get any cheaper. And so how can we capitalize on an opportunity now and, and really lock in those uh, in that dollar amount and really be mindful stewards of, of the tasks that we've been given. And, and we're, not, we're not gonna find any cheaper money. It's, as we know, everything indicates that things keep going up and um, let's, let's keep that in mind as we're trying to really maximize here, and I know it's scary numbers, but I think that that lever really keeps everybody in line and, and helps us move forward with that. Kathy, I think the, the numbers were pretty astounding when I first saw the numbers. The number that's now amazing to me is that we can actually keep it to $3. I think, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but didn't you expect it to be that more? Mm -hmm. Much more? I mean, I'm, I don't know how you're doing this. It's like 1997. <laughs> and yes, the big figure is big, but I think it's amazing that you can keep that promise, make that promise again for 10 years. That, that's incredible. Other comments or questions? <clears throat> How confident are we in the calculations and the assumptions? 
Well, we're... <laughs> I'm very confident because I made them. <laughs> I checked them. <laughs> where, where, where is the risk in any of that? Is it, is it purely the interest rate, that if that jumps quickly, or is it something else? Or are, are we, you know, are we, are we really ready to say, you know, this is, this is firm, this is, we're gonna, this is gonna happen? We figured 4% valuation growth. If, uh, if they crash and they, you know, they go negative for uh, two or three years, that will hurt this plan. But uh, four is fairly conservative based on what we've done year in and year out. In the, I mean, we went, we went back to 2000, kind of played that out. But that's where the, that's where the biggest um, unknown is, is what will ha exactly happen with the valuation increase in the district. So it's 4% annualized. Yep. Yeah, we run highs and lows in various scenarios to try to get comfortable with it, so. Mary? And the district has taken into account inflation, which is a prudent thing to do. But please understand that the taxpayers and the homeowners will also take that 4% valuation into accord to when they're thinking about this amount. Because you can do the $3 all day long, but when their valuation on their home goes up when it's assessed at a higher value, their taxes are going to go up just as the district will pay more inflation for what it doesn't do tomorrow. One, uh, just on the 4%, which is an estimate, it's not locked in stone, that includes new construction as well. I think uh, I've watched a house for since 2000, and the average valuation increase in that house runs about two and a half, some, somewhere in there. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's about two and a half. So the other one and a half is new construction, um, which is an empty lot a house gets put on it or a business gets put on it. Other comments or questions? I have a, I have a question related to Whittier, but I'm not sure it's pertinent to, to this financial discussion. Let's, let's finish the financial discussion and then we'll jump into that. Um, looking for your thoughts uh, are you comfortable with these num numbers are you comfortable with the risk are you ready to move forward with this as a recommendation to the board Theron. Um, i'm comfortable with the number i'm comfortable with the the net increase i would say i'm uncomfortable with saying we're promising anything that we can't predict the the future um, there will be a future bond at some point um, whether that's five ten fifteen year i mean we want this to be a ten-year plan but if something were to happen, Whittier's roof leaks something, you know, they'll have to come sooner. And if we say a promise, then what's it gonna do to a future position? Yeah, there are no promises. Other comments on the financial part of it? Any other concerns you wanna bring up on the financial part of it? I need a sign of consensus. Yes? yes. Do you support this? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. We have consensus that this is the plan that we'll recommend to the board. Um, well, let's go through the the uh, report with Joe Donovan, and in there there are specific. Uh, pieces about Whittier, and would that be an appropriate place, Jack, that if you want to, or do you want to start it? Yeah, well, I, this, here's my basic question about Whittier. Uh, if we acquire that other square block, what is, what, will, what is the footprint of the new Whittier, and does the current Whittier go, yeah, go offline, or does it stay online during the new construction, because you've moved, the, you're constructing on that new block, or maybe a combination of the new block and uh, what's now the athletic facilities. Yeah. Jeff Kreider. Because I, I, if, if it's coming offline, then we have another crowding situation uh, that we're gonna have to be my, my vision is that uh, once we acquire that, we'll design a new middle school. There won't be any prototypes with that one to fit that site. We'll construct it while Whittier is still being operated. 
And then once we get the building set, we'll, we'll raise the existing Whittier and put the parking lot in that area. So kind of like we've done some of these elementary schools okay. where we keep the building operational until right to the end. Then we'll move furnishings and equipment over to the new building, you know, in time, just in time for the school. This will be a little bigger move, so it'll be a little more challenging, but I think it can happen because we'll probably bring some of that on online earlier, so. Mark Twain, Susan B. Anthony being one of the recent examples, right? Yep. Okay. That was my basic question. So that's, what, other that's what our intention is, and that's why getting that property is important. Um, that parking lot that we exists, we might be able to sell that um, where, it, where it exists, because just looking at it, that might be a, an out. The parking out, lot across outsource. the street. Yeah. That's about a half a block. Yeah, so, but across. until we get the design and those sort of things, those are all up in the air, and we'll have to see how it all fits down through there. Any other construction questions for Jeff before we jump into the report? <laughs> Katrina. <laughs> the Whittier building isn't registered historical, is it? No, it's not. It's not. Oh. Um, have you guys looked at not raising the building? Has that been at all part of? Virtually impossible to do with an ADA if we're, if we're trying to achieve the ADA mm -hmm. scenario with the 18 levels. Um, very hard to modify. It's, uh, it's I'm, not, I'm not saying that the school stays a school, but could the building stay a building? And then could, we would could have to the probably, parking lot be a, a different, could the parking lot go somewhere different so that the neighborhood doesn't lose a that's historical That's a potential building? possibility. Um, we would we have to acquire more property at that point. Okay. So you would have to look at that. My hope is that if we do raise that, we'll be taking some of that old original Whittier that was torn down in, in 1923 and incorporate it in something on site so we, we don't lose that history or some parts of that building mm -hmm. as well. Very similar to what we did um, both at Susan B. and Sotomayor, so. Well, coming from All Saints and having Dakota Abilities move into Longfellow has just been an amazing thing. Um, so I just wanted to advocate if we can save the building, we should creatively think about ways to do that. Um, and then my other question is, um, how long are we going to wait until the next task force meets? Because if we're talking 10 years out, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but are we going to try to be a little bit more proactive as we're moving forward now and so that we're not behind and that if Whittier's roof falls in, we're not in a pickle again with planning in a, this community involved way yeah well i think the board will make that decision as we move forward and get things going but dr maher can probably address that while he comes up there if you look on page 10 of the recommendations there is a bullet point for there that uh, we talked about the school board should use a robust and transparent engagement effort similar to the one the task force used to establish new school boundaries whoops that's not the right one Joe, help me, where did we have that? Uh, it is on, let's see, page nine, number five, 10-year plan. During their deliberations, task force members spoke of their embarking a 10-year plan and recommended the school board continue similar task forces at regular intervals to stay ahead of enrollment growth, equity needs, and the need to renovate buildings. So would that put us in a, in a bind with Whittier then? Because we're saying right now, that Whittier is 10 years out. So is that gonna put us behind where we should be? Should it be seven years or six years from now to yeah. plan on the Whittier and the other older buildings that are needing help? I think that's a great question. I, th I think number one, the, the model for, for us in terms of uh, handling these issues has been set. We did it now with the strategic plan. We did it now with this community engagement process and we'll continue that process going forward. Um, also, I think we look at all of our facilities every year. So the next, when it comes time for us to say it's time or we've acquired the, the, the land necessary, I think we mobilize uh, a process very similar to this one, whether that's five years out or eight years out or 10 years out, I think we're, we're ready to do that. We don't want to get in the position that we're in now, uh, where we're a little bit behind the eight ball, 
and we want to we want to plan in a in a proactive way. So I don't see that as an issue, but I think it's a relevant concern. Yeah. Just a quick question. I, it's in our packet. I know Jeff that you have uh, put a shadow building uh, within the Whittier site. What it might look like. Are we looking at the McGovern type building or a memorial type building? No, it will be a, a totally designed for that site. I just put those on there just to give you a relationship of how that might look and what size that would fit on. Okay, and, and if I'm getting ahead of this, please redirect me, but a new high school, what does our design look like there plan-wise? That will be a... Uh, will it look like Washington or Roosevelt or... No. We're, we're planning on doing a full redesign okay. from scratch. So it won't be, I mean, we can take pieces of what is good mm -hmm. there and integrate it, but I don't see, I don't think anybody will see Washington Roosevelt in that building. Okay, just interested, I've gotten some questions since our last meeting on that. You know, are we staying with two-story buildings? Are we gonna look at four-story buildings again type thing? I'm just curious. It's not a point I'm trying to make it's either too, way. Too early in the process, I have no preconceived notions on how that's gonna look. And once we get RFPs for the architects and get process, we'll have design teams and work together on what that's gonna look like. So there'll be a team very similar to this with uh, educators and principals and high school people uh, working on that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other construction questions? If not, Joe, if you want to jump in. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I want to walk through the uh, the report that you have. Again, this is a report that you would have received uh, in draft form by e uh, email. Um, something for you to read over the Memorial Day weekend. Um, and then there's a revised version that you um, would have picked up um, in hard copy. That's a slightly. It's very very similar. Um, but but uh, a few little changes and little formatting changes. And, and folks, um, as I put this together, um, just a couple of notes. What I really tried to capture your dialogue um, that you had in creating the report, I really wanted to have a document that kind of was a standalone report. That is that a community member could pick up this report, not having been here, not really know, you know, watching video, but kind of knowing the process that you're going through. So I probably um, included maybe more background um, that, than what is necessary, but I thought it was important um, to include that. This, folks, is, is really where the, the rubber hits the road in terms of the work of the group. And so um, what I thought is that I could just kind of go through very, very quickly um, at kind of a 30,000 foot level and, and um, kind of explain you know, the different sections, and then maybe um, talk about, um, you know, what, what works in a report, what doesn't work, um, and, and maybe we'll have uh, the co-chairs uh, facilitate any, any type of, of, um, of feedback there. I'll note that, as Nan mentioned, you know, little pieces, um, you know, you can follow up with me directly, and I wanna apologize kind of in my haste to, to get this done. Um, I, I had it uh, proofed, but, like super quickly. Um, so there are going to be, I'm sure, some grammatical issues. Um, so again, um, and, and I should mention, I, I, I do in my work, I do a lot of these reports, and I always think it's important I, I don't use templates, I always um, um, start over. But this was, and I added a few sections here that I, I don't typically add. This one started out with a letter from the task force. Um, I followed up with an executive summary and then I went into an introduction. Again, if you're looking at the hard copy that was printed, um, you're gonna see that that's on page four. Again, just to provide a little bit of background um, for community members who maybe um, aren't familiar with the work of this, of this group. Then I went in and tried to, um, in a page or less, uh, starting on page five, and I've outlined facility needs, the things that you're um, challenged with. And again, kind of tried to distill those in a way that I could, I could um, explain quickly. Then on page six, um, describe the process that you went through. I tried to very briefly outline your meetings, again, your meetings in brief. And I tried to spend quite a bit of time, starting on page eight, by trying to capture as much as I could uh, the dialogue that you had. I just was really happy with um, the great conversations here, and I tried to 
do it in a way that would make sense again for maybe a community member who's just getting up to speed on, on the great work that you've done here. And then on page nine, I have the recommendations. And again, I really tried to um, um, kind of distill them down um, to bullet points. And then you're going to see that there's some additional information, um, your names, um, the task force charge that still needs to be added, the results of the task force survey um, that you reviewed last week. So again, the idea here is, uh, is to have a report that speaks to everything that you've done here, all of the, the, the great conversations, but do it um, in a way that again is a summary, it's distilled down and provided an overview. So I guess with that, maybe I'll turn it over to um, uh, co-chairs and I'd love to hear, um, you know, not only what you, what you like, you're not gonna hurt my feelings, uh, what, what you don't like, what needs to be changed. Comments, questions for Joe. So one of the things that I think Diana, can you use the microphone, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, one of the things that I noticed is you talked about the 1997 um, on, on page six. And I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't be telling or page eight, talking to people about that a little bit sooner in the document. <clears throat> about the equity piece. About that, you know, yes. Because I think it's important that we haven't done anything since 1997. I'd just like to see if there's a way to bring it out in the document a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. yep. Does that Do work, that? Joe? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Other feedback? <clears throat> Jack. On uh, page three, the school board should consider the land gift made by Sanford Health to determine whether the location is appropriate for a new high school. I just want to be sure that the, the report indicates that we're not, ob we don't feel the school district should be obligated to accept that gift. Uh, it certainly should take a serious look at it, but it should, the location should be uh, the first and most important criteria. Um, on page nine, if you look at number three, it does go into that in a little bit more depth. I saw that. Yep. I think what I'm hearing you say in the recommendation, make clear that there's no, oblig no obligation to, to, to do that. Find the best location for the high school within that, within that section of the city. If it happens to be the Sanford site, fine. Good. Yep. Jennifer. And this group took very seriously, I think, the community feedback that was collected on the comment cards and spent uh. a lot of time reviewing those documents. And um, there was some dialogue amongst the group in the second meeting that included um, the verbiage teacher satisfaction, student achievement, and diversity. Uh, and I would like to see those elements included. I think it speaks to this group's commitment to representing the public uh, in those important details. That's great. Dina. Um, I think to that point, Joe, even on page one where we talk about the strategic planning process in sort of that middle paragraph, I'd like to see right up front in the letter from the task force and then in the summary say that we reviewed the information provided by the community. So if people are just reading the letter or the summary, they know that one of the things that drove this community was the information that we got not only from those community engagement processes, but from the focus groups that Dr. Maher um, carried on, and then the fact that the city planners paid, played a large, um, provided a large amount of material for us. And if we can highlight that, if people are just skimming it, they may catch that. Got it, thank you for that. Aaron. I'd like to echo what Jennifer was saying there in the community feedback um, that the, the concept of residential neighborhoods and encouraging uh, building schools and keeping them in core neighborhoods was something that came back in the community feedback. Uh, so having a recommendation on that bullet point. And uh, on, the, on the Whittier front, 
I'm just not necessarily convinced that we can wait 10 years and and to hear, I think it was Mr. Morrison talking about, well, you know, we could take it up sooner if, if we absolutely needed to. Um, I'd like to see a recommendation put in there that, you know, recognizing that Whittier replacement requires the acquisition of the land, um, uh, but that, that it, how do I want to say it, that it keeps the Whittier online for the immediate future to accommodate district growth, uh, but the replacement of Whittier should progress in a, in a parallel format should the land be acquired in a shorter time period than's predicted, new construction should begin as soon as possible. Um, I don't know, that, that neighborhood's been waiting for a new school for a long time. We've had a lot of new schools you know, and in that so time period. essentially uh, increasing the commitment that this task force has to, to the Whittier neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a different view of that. I, I think we do have a commitment to the Whittier neighborhood and I think we are committed to replacing it. I, I'm not sure I would be comfortable, I'm not comfortable saying as soon as possible. Okay. I, th I, th I think it, We've, we've been told that the school has at least a 10 year life, maybe longer, uh, that, it, that we have equity. It's not, it's not new and shiny. We have multiple levels. We have ADA issues, uh, but it appears to be quite serviceable. And I haven't heard anybody say that education is being, uh, being hurt, quality of education is being hurt at Whittier while we maintain that building. Yes, we are committed to replacing it, but I think we have to be, uh, yeah, I think we have to be pr pretty conservative about that. Can you grab the microphone? What you um, also have a negative on is the priority that's been set, which means that if you're going to accelerate something, something's got to move out in order to stay within that $3 per month, you know, uh, threshold. So we should be careful. I mean, we, should, we can make a, a stronger commitment comment towards Whittier, just to make sure that it's very clear that, you know, the task force was committed to Whittier uh, and replacing Whittier, um, uh, but uh, leave some opening that uh, allows us to actively manage mm -hmm. those, those priorities. Dina. Vernon, I understand what Dr. Maher told us about the task force meeting and a 10-year plan, but what I heard at those community meetings over and over again is, I feel like we're behind the power curve. I feel like we're behind the power curve. I want to take that seriously. I also, in no way disparaging the people I'm looking at, but there's a lot of retirees on that side of the table, <laughs> and I don't want to push that out 10 years and then go, gosh, we lost all that history because we said we weren't gonna do this. So, you know, I don't know if this task force is accommodating to say we would like to think about or recommend that the board consider a five-year facilities review. Um, we do lots of other things, or the board does lots of other things um, on a five-year review. We look at safety, we look at lots of things every five years. Maybe this becomes part of that um, process. Let's talk about that, Angela. So mine is actually kind of um, a little bit of what Deanna is addressing, but um, for two things. The first thing is um, when you look at pages 3, 4, and 9, 10, there are very uh, clear recommendations of the task force, and then you, of course, do a great job of talking about the process and the dialogue, and then you come back to those recommendations at the conclusion of the report, which makes really strong sense. My question would be, um, we've had a lot of robust information. There's been rich discussion, there's been incredible data, and I don't know if the recommendations fully capture the thrust of the quality of information. Um, I, I do think the dialogue gets in there, but I think some of those, um, just maybe punching up some of those key issues, kind of Jack has mentioned some, Deanna has mentioned some, and I'm sure you'll continue to hear more, but I think that 910 is where I'd be looking for that information. There are other comments, uh, especially in regard to the uh, regular intervals for looking at facilities. Does the group want to see stronger language there? Oh, heck yeah to that. Okay. <laughs> Agree? Okay. 
Mike, does the city have, I don't recall, is there uh, a building, I suppose annually through the CIP process? Yeah, the, the, the five-year capital program is updated annually, but, but our, what we call our growth management plan, our comprehensive plan, we typically do a major rewrite of it every 15 to 20 years, but we do a five-year review okay. just as a policy. So I think that that's a good recommendation. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that you, you said that because I'm, that's where I was going with my comment before. And I'm also, I just have to be honest, in this entire process, I've been thinking about, well, what about all the really cool things that our schools should be doing for kids? I mean, they're already doing great things, but are there technologies or are there ways of learning or are there, you know, entire processes of curriculum that maybe we're not even getting to those discussions because we're so far behind with the dollars that we need to spend to build the buildings just to you know house the kids. So um, maybe in those five-year discussions, we'll be able to do almost like vision casting that will you know, coincide with facilities planning that will maybe make our school district even better than it is now. Any other comments, questions? Just had another question. If we, there was quite a bit of public input that we got at the open houses, and I think you gave us a visual summary. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we could include in the report That's to help? A great idea. Yep. What did you call that? Word, Word cloud. Word cloud. Yeah. There you go. Because the next task force, the first thing they'll do is read this one. It's important we capture that. And they'll go, what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> the only other comment I have is I, I thought we said a middle school on the east side, and I thought we decided to strike southeast. Am, or am I wrong? Because I thought somebody said south central, or. East Central, maybe that's not a big deal, but I just looked back on that map that we looked at and really. I think, I think as my memory serves me, we, we did narrow it to the Southeast, southeast. eventually. And Is that right, Mike? That's fine if that was a consensus. I was just thinking we said. But I think we were it. saying oh, we south of 26. Yes. Wherever you have infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> we did agree on Southeast after lengthy debate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our question. <laughs> Anything else? Um, we also talked about equity, which is on page eight. And w we mentioned that quite a bit from the beginning and that came across from the community input. And, and we talk just briefly here in the dialogue, it says something about equity, but what does equity really mean? Because we we're limited to just facilities and talking about that here. And equity for us has been like square footage. On and it just seems for the discussion and things we have, we have a, is this all we want to say about equity? What else would you like to see in there about that, Diana? You want me to write it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have? Well, I just think it's really, we, this is our opportunity in the school district to, to, to really look at equity for all of our schools across the district so that as much as possible, we don't have schools that have the haves and the have nots. And, and that's where I hope we're going. That's the vision is to try to move in that direction. And the statement just didn't, doesn't seem strong enough. Joe, is that, heard that we've heard feedback? it a lot. Yep, helpful. Yep. Yep. That's good. So maybe that's the suggestion for the next committee that goes after boundaries is that equity is really important coming out of this committee. I, I, as far as that goes, I think really just do, as you're saying to de, to really define what we're talking about. I mean to. It, it might take more language than just so we don't have the have and ha haves and has nots. I mean, just to 
be complete so that there's an understanding about what equity does mean. I agree. I think it, if, if I'm envisioning what Diane, uh, Diane is saying is that in 97, we talked about square footage and equity in buildings, and this group has talked a lot about equity being bigger than that because we have achieved that, but now we want to take the next step within that equity um, vein. So uh, I think And Joe, if sense. you have questions on that, and Dina has great I'll be history on that. Yeah, <laughs> no, this is good. No, she has great history. Yeah. I just did. Through both yeah. of them, yes. Thank you. I mean, I would think that the reason why, the main reason why equity was looked at in that standpoint is because we have growing enrollment. And we looked at the growing enrollment in light of what the facility needs are. And so that's what helped, have helped us to establish the 1 to 24.3 ratio and then the population in each building so we could determine what the needs were for facilities. So that's a good point that equity can be looked at from these different angles. All right. You know, we've done this largely all by consensus, but I am going to ask that on this final report, with the changes that you've recommended, that we do take an official vote on the recommendations so we know where everyone is at. Um, so we're we just going to go around the room and, and uh, vote aye if you support the, the report and recommendations. Could we, you know. could we do a, just a hand, maybe count instead, and we then sure. if it's majority, or we could look at consensus, mm -hmm. and just based upon, do you, do you feel like your voice was reflected in the report? I think that's the, the overarching question. So all those in favor, raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. If, we, if we go around and either do a, you know, a, a yes or no, um, what if we do have some qualms about what the final result will be? So there should be some facility to allow us to kind of either edit or do something. You don't necessarily have to be bound by that, but um, we can take a general direction, you know, um, vote. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a, a you know, a passionate one, once you see a, the next draft, uh, we should allow for that. Yes. <clears throat> Angela, another point of clarification, what supplementary, are there any of the, um, for example, the financial breakdown, uh, the calculator, are we including any of those supplementary documents in this report, Joe, or is this report, as we see it, what will be presented? The typical situation would be that that uh, with the meeting, since you, since you received a packet before each meeting, normally what, what we would do is we would have a footnote that would include a link to that material so that that isn't lost. And that, that's typically where that would go. My one comment is I do think we had um, for a very long time other projects, $17.8 million to me. Um, that's a significant amount. And I think it'd be nice to detail what was included in that other sure. projects for those who wouldn't have been present. Um, I think that's a large number that should be specified. Will we have the opportunity to, to di for that to be disseminated to us after it's been changed um, and for us to be able to have, to be able to decide that we, that we approve of the final form? Joe? Sure, I'd suggest that, that uh, when I'm done with the next version, I send it to the, the co-chairs and it's distributed and then we can have another round maybe by email if, if that works. Maybe for the purposes of tonight, we could just um, come up with a head shake or whatever so that we just have a sense that we're moving in the right direction, that you feel that your voice has been heard and is reflected in the report. And then as um, Joe adds, uh, some of the comments uh, that you all have raised and we send that back out if there's any, um, if any of you feel passionately that that does not reflect your voice that you can articulate that back. Um, is that comfortable? Okay, so do we feel like our voice was by and large reflected in the report and that we're headed in the direction that is what you all feel comfortable with as a task force? Just kind show of nod, of hands, or... maybe so we can have a clear show. Right? 
any other concerns? I, I have a question on page 10. Um, it talks about spend on all the projects, 150 to 200 million, which will include, um, are, will that be changed to a number recommendation and an exact, because I, I, I understand that, that you have, you know, different things in there. Was, was there, were numbers crunched to know what would happen if it was 150 million, as we said last week, would be our jumping off point? Or what were their numbers crunched for 200 million? So, so to give yeah. taxpayers an idea yeah. of in. My, my sense is that that'll be updated based mm -hmm. on the work that was done earlier. Based on the financial yeah, inf that's right. information that we agreed to tonight with that so 190. It, so it will only say 190 or 80, whatever it is, million. 90. Dr. Maher, are you comfortable with us using that number or, or do you want a range for the board to consider? I really think that it's important for us and for the board to do what your recommendation is. So, so we're okay either way. However, however you want to present this report, the board will begin reacting to that report as soon as next week. So however, however you want to present that to the board, I think is, is well within the bounds of what we hoped for from this task force. Mary, as I remember the dialogue at that meeting where we talked about whether we wanted to go with a range or a cap, um, there was part of the group thought a range and then I think, um, Dana, you brought up the point of a, of a cap and um, your thought behind that was that if we have a cap, then we've, specified what we would like to fund as opposed to a range that the needs then were a little more of a gray um, piece of the pie. Is that? I think as far as presenting it to the community, uh, ease of presenting it to the community, being a little more solid on what we're giving them. So otherwise it sounds like we haven't really quite figured it out. I like the cap idea or the specific number idea. Better. I think we ought to go with the. I would go with the specific number. I think we've seen some. We had. We've had some very good information presented to us in advance of this meeting, and again at this meeting tonight. Um, if if the district is truly confident in their calculations and f and think and we think we have managed our risk and married uh, and and uh, managed the variables, I think we ought to lock it in at 190 million or mm -hmm. slightly under that. Okay. And up make it a specific number. And I would not. I would exclude the. I would exclude a, a range. I would just say, yep. hundred ninety million dollars. Okay. Vernon, I, um, I, I really appreciate that comment. Maybe I went and sat down and thought about your question a little bit further, and I thought really I should have answered it this way. It depends on if you want to use three dollar the three dollar promise, if you will. And I understood we don't want to use promise, but the the three dollar strategy. If you want to use the $3 strategy, it's a specific figure, and Jack just explained it better than I could. Yep. And we all said by consensus that we were comfortable with that, so uh, $190 million. Okay. Dina. There is one more thing I think is a task force that I would like to add, and it is in that um, facilities report on page one where we thank the board. I'd like um, this task force to thank Mr. Donovan. I have never seen a process so well crafted, executed, and supported. Um, as, as a former board member, I know we have asked for something like this to happen. I, I never dreamed there was someone out who could facilitate it so well. And I think he made our jobs really easy. Um, and I would like, um, with your permission to suggest that we acknowledge his contribution in this report. That's a great comment. All right. So we will get, oh, oh go ahead. Tom. Go ahead. Tom. <clears throat> One that came up through our discussions here. Um, so on page 10, the uh, first and second bullet points up there refers to the new middle school um, and then the you know, school board using a robust engagement effort. 
similar to the one, <clears throat> one used when they um, did establish new boundaries within the school. I know the last um, meeting we had, we were talking about the redrawing of boundaries and stuff, and I it kind of went through all these bullet points, and I, well, I guess there is one here under boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually under number four, I, I do see it, so that addresses my, can my, that was kind of my big concern is just about the boundaries of alleviating the overcrowding in the other schools because some people might still have that question even though we are building a new high school, middle school, and elementary of is that going to fix the problems on the west side. Being clear that boundaries will be redrawn. And that that would have been reviewed regardless of new facilities. <clears throat> All right, are we good? The, on number four, could it actually have something addressed in there regarding the overcrowding on the west side schools? Of the redrawing of the boundaries, just to address that kind of a gorilla in the room? That was um, number four on page nine. Yeah, just to have it added in of, you know, alleviating, the, you don't even need to say on the west side, you just say overcrowding in. Within the district. In yeah, within the district. The district. Yeah. In order to yeah, because I mean, uh, Roosevelt and Memorial are the most overcrowded, but they're not the only overcrowded schools. Yeah. How, what do you all, what do, what do you think about that? We'll just open that up for a discussion. That language added to number four on page nine um, under the boundaries. Do you want to restate that please, Thomas? Just to have a language listed in there um, of redrawing the boundaries to alleviate overcrowding within the district. Though we don't necessarily need to say within the west side, but just as Mike was saying, within the district, I think would be enough language to really cover that, because that's really what the purpose is. Equity. Right, equity being the right 21.4 to one and so, it, yeah, to maintain student achievement and teacher job satisfaction. Okay. One How, comment in that number four. Uh, we probably should strike the word passage of a September 28 referendum mm -hmm. consideration. It's presumptuous to say it's going to pass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so add language. Are we all in agreement to add that language? That's a big thought um, on alleviating the overpopulation on the west side to bullet point four on page nine. Overcrowding. Or overcrowding, yes, thank you. <laughs> Though there is overpopulation, <laughs> that's a good thing. The population of the school. Oh, that's fine, okay. Um, Kathy had brought up a point in language, and I'm not sure how the equity piece is in statute. Um, as far as school board and stuff goes, but is equity the right word? Um, we were suggesting maybe parity. So I don't know how. You know, I think that's probably for the school board to deal with. I think okay. we're starting to get into the, the weeds here. <laughs> Any word we use, we'll... The word smithing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So is it a good time to talk about our timeline going forward sure. and, okay. So you'll see at the bottom of your uh, agenda are, are the next uh, meetings. Uh, presentation of the draft report to the board uh, will be at a work session, mm -hmm. Wednesday, June 6th at 2 p.m. Open to the public, certainly open to the task force if, if you want to be there and, and we would encourage that. We'd love to have that support. And then the final presentation report to the board Monday, June 11th at, at 5.30 p.m. And again, uh, we'd love to see you there. Offer your comments and, and thoughts and, and uh, support for the process and, and the conclusions that we reached. Are there questions? In this room. Yes, in this room, correct. Well, with That's that, calendars. yeah, unless there is anything else, I think we have completed our work early. Yeah, <laughs> yeah question. Uh -huh. George has a question. Yes. Yes. Come up, please, George.
for the record, George Hahn, Washington High, 1967. A very trying year with a student body of 3,300 teachers in the pavilion when we started. We know crowding, believe me. The issue of overcrowding really has not been defined. There's been discussion about how many students in a class constitutes overcrowding. Is it 30, is it 34, is it 38? There has been discussion, but no definitive answers. That has not been factored into the need for facilities. Another factor that has never entered into any discussions, you use the word, I believe correctly, parity in facilities as opposed to equity. Equity is the wrong term, parity is the correct term. We have always had the have and the have not neighborhoods. I went to that really great junior high school known as Patrick Henry. That was in a have neighborhood. Edison was not, yet they produced some great students. Uh, Whittier was not in a have neighborhood, but they produced some great students and had a lot of great teachers. I think it's the quality of the teaching, it's the quality of the discipline, and it's the quality of the overall curriculum that determines the, the, the general nature of the students coming out of the system. It's not the big fancy building. Now let's talk about these big fancy buildings for just a minute. Do you really think in 20 or 40 years Education is going to be conducted in big concrete glass and steel boxes and buildings and stuff like that. I'm nearly 69 years old. I won't live to see education get out of the box at the rate we're going. We're talking about building boxes of steel, glass, and concrete for the next 100 years. Around the world, education is taking a whole different imaginative shape. If you built a three or four story high geodesic dome with three levels and elevators within, sound barriers out of certain types of fabric and had a completely open hemispheric dome for a school, you would be able to have incredible education opportunities. Anybody here ever see Star Wars or Star Trek? Anybody? Are you old enough? <laughs> okay. Holograms have been around for 75 years in concept and in actual practice for 60 years since the creators of Star Trek came up with the idea. Do you realize there are right now on the boards, if not actually out there, holograms of William Shakespeare through narration which can teach English. Mathematics can be taught by a holographic projection of Einstein. Music can be taught by a holographic projection of Mozart. We need not have flesh, blood, flap jaw to teach. We need inspiration. We need to educate people in the ways of the world, in the ways that we are in the future, considering our, our planet is going. Bad grammar, but you know where I'm heading. We don't need 100-year brick and mortar buildings. We need to get more practical with respect to, well, where are we gonna be in 40 years with this wonderful, grandiose, big 80,000 square foot building? Recreation, you might need a gym that is contained because it has noise and you gotta have a square basketball court. They don't make those round yet, I don't <laughs> think. These are some of the things that have to be put into the mix. What is overcrowding? How does it affect our schools? Now, I'm a realtor. I'm here on behalf of our Realtor Association of Sioux Falls. I'm with Remax. I've been a realtor 34 years, a mortgage banker for 24 of those. I understand economics very well. I just don't happen to have a PhD behind my name. Every projection that we have made is based on the assumption that real estate prices and values will continue to rise. In the last year, interest rates for single family mortgages have risen by 1% plus. Just in the month of May, we have seen reductions in prices for existing homes and newly constructed homes go down by several thousand dollars, anywhere from one, two, to three, even four percent. This means the values are declining a little bit because the interest rates are up. Very simple, higher interest rates, you can afford less in terms of principal and interest and taxes. If they go up, we can afford less in terms of the overall home. So every time we raise taxes, we lower the value of the homes in essence. Therefore, that has to be thrown into the mix. Our figures are pretty good. Mr. Veek said he has confidence in them because he did them. It's a competent presentation. I understand it very well. But that's not a guarantee of constancy of values throughout a 10 or 20 or 30 year bond term. 
There's no guarantee that the value is going to continue to go up, up, up. We're attracting people into Sioux Falls. We're getting more students. But one of the big issues is we're attracting low wage jobs. This is not a rising economy, rising wage mecca. To own a home right now, first time home buyer priced home, 180,000, you need 38,400 a year in income. That is $18.55 an hour, single or combined. That excludes a huge number of people. This is why apartments are being built by the thousands. They can't afford homes. Someday some of these may be converted to single family owner condominiums, but right now the American dream is getting squashed because of prices going up, taxes going up, interest rates going up. All of these several considerations I have not read about in your, your documents that have been published. I have not heard it discussed. I felt it warranted uh, uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, George. Are there other public comments? Please step up to the microphone. Oh, take the hand mic back there. Hi, my name is Chad Powell and I'm from Troop 48 here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, the two questions I have right now are, what are you guys going to do as far as ADA accessibility in the near future? And then the other thing is, what are the what are you guys going to do as far as attendance for these kids? Because I'm seeing these, a lot of these kids skip school um, about every day. So I'd like you guys to look into that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeff Kreider. Do you want to address the ADA pieces uh, in our infrastructure? Um, virtually all our buildings, with the exception of WD, are ADA accessible, um, where we can get people into the levels, um, bathrooms, those sort of things. Um, the equity in 97, we really made it an effort to get everything, and uh, gyms and where public can get to that they need to get to. Um, we fall into a different level of ADA. So sometimes we have to bring a classroom down to the first floor, but we have elevators and, and so forth. We went beyond what we needed to do. Um, and once we get Whittier taken care of, uh, we should be 99%. Um, so um, we should be in pretty good shape as far as ADA. Very good, thank you. Are there other individuals in the audience that, uh, from the public that would like to speak? All right. Kate Parker is here. Look, before we get to Kate, there are a couple things I, I want to address. Um, first of all, uh, I think uh, all of us uh, have been great advocates for the school district. I would like Dr. Maher to talk about, as we lead up to a campaign, what the school district is allowed and not allowed to do by state law, and then I want to follow up with some comments there. I wasn't prepared for that, Vern. Sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's really pretty simple. We can, uh, we can talk at uh, length about what the process has been and what the solution is. We can't advocate for or against the, the uh, ultimate uh, bond election. So, uh, but, we can, but we can talk at any group with anybody um, regarding uh, the uh, nuts and bolts behind the election. Um, we can't spend any uh, of our human resources or any of our financial resources campaigning for an election. We can only talk about the, uh, uh, the, the, the detail of the election without, advoc without advocating for or against. So no dollar spent by the district and what you put out there is informational or educational in nature. Yep, everything, everything we can put out is, is factual. Here are the number of buildings we have. Here's the enrollment that we have. Here's, a, uh, here, here's our current tax rate. Here would be the tax rate if a bond uh, referendum passed. Those sorts of things, we can do all of those things. All of those factual informational items, um, we can still be that resource. Rules that Mike Cooper and Mark Cotter are familiar with as uh, same rules apply to city government, they apply to county governments as well. Uh, so with that, I, 
I will follow up with an email um, to this group because I do think it's important to, that uh, the public interested in this be able to advocate for it, not with any school taxpayers' dollars, not in school facilities. Uh, but if you are interested in helping get that message out, um, reply to my email and, and we'll figure out um, a, a group that might be interested in doing such. Do members of the school board have the same legal restriction? Yes. And, <laughs> oh, holy cow, um, teachers in classrooms, restrictions there, board policy there, district policy. It, it goes beyond policy, it's a law in terms of what we, what we can do. Any, any employee of the district, we can't use district uh, resources. So that's time, um, that's uh, facilities, that's um, class time, school time. We can't use any, any of that to campaign for or campaign against the issue. We can use those resources to put together information that, that's factual that can be used for folks who want to campaign for or against. But we can't, but we can't take a side. You're not going to see us do anything other than provide factual information or to promote get out and vote. Aaron, but for clarification, there's no state law similar to a federal law like the Hatch Act that would prevent a volunteering situation. Correct. Uh, I think the, the big key there is I can't use my platform as right. a superintendent. Somebody can't use their platform as a teacher. Or but, their but, e email but, or but, anything but, like that. Right. But all of us, but all of us are independent citizens outside of the, the time that we're at work. Very good. Kate, are you ready? Um, just wanted to stand back a little bit. Um, have a few thank yous actually first to get through. Um, Joe, thank you for getting us through and facilitating this process. It's been um, uh, just a, a great process, very transparent. Um, and I know that you all feel the same way. So um, just want to thank you for your time and look forward to seeing you again. Um, and Deanne and um, Doug and Todd and Brian and um, I know all of you have put in quite a lot of time um, on the reports and the presentations that you all have seen here today. So from the board, we just want to thank you for all of your time. And lastly, for all of you, um, we've taken you away from your families uh, four nights over the last couple of uh, months, as well as time reading reports and getting through all the information. So I know that it's been a lot of your time, but we really appreciate it and um, look forward to seeing the final report. Um, but we just wanna thank you for, again, for being here and providing your input. It's been really great, at least for me, and I think for the fellow board members that are, that are here as well, that you know, just your input has been great to hear and you know, the consensus that you've all come to. So we appreciate it. You've really done a lot of the hard work for us. Um, so we look forward to, to hearing that report. Um, a couple of tasks Deanne has asked me to do is just um, uh, back in the room over there, she would just like you to drop off your binders. You can keep the materials inside of them. She's got some folders for you that you can put your materials in, but we're trying to be good stewards with our taxpayer dollars, <laughs> so we need those binders back, please. Um, and we have a little parting gift for you as well. So again, thank you um, and look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Thank you to all of you. You know, I, I want to also say the staff has just been a pleasure to work with. Uh, they've f fulfilled everything we've ever asked for and just been very available. And, and I've had the pleasure of serving on a lot of boards, but boy, I don't know a board that has uh, done more homework uh, than this one. I've been really pleased with it. And, I hope you all feel as good about the homework you did as, as I do. I think we've come to a great result and conclusion. Vernon and I share the same sentiment. 
I'm sorry, I should have thanked the co-chairs, um, Vernon and Nan, too, because you've had some extra meetings on top of this. So um, sorry to interrupt, but I want to thank you. We are dismissed. Thank you. Oh, it's early. <laughs>